have the pleasure of hosting Joao, um, who basically, I mean, me and my colleague Musa also were like, uh, also had the pleasure of working with him. We were co supervised by him while working on our master's thesis. Uh, Joao is a research fellow at the Royal Academy of Engineering. He is working at the Visual Geometry Group at the University of Oxford. His research focuses generally on computer vision and deep learning, and more focuses on like main topics such as robot mapping, navigation, uh, reinforcement learning, and 3D geometry. Um, so basically, without any further ado, we, I mean, we stage is yours, John. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, Nasir, just a sec while I get these to share. And uh, there you go. Can you see that? Yes. OK. Yes. Great. OK, yeah. Um, yeah, once again, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's really nice to be here, even if it's uh, uh, sort of across the wire. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about this work uh, that we presented last CVPR. We also have this follow-up work, which I'll briefly describe that will appear at uh, 3DV uh, in a couple of months. And uh, yeah, it's called the Light Touch Approach to Teaching Transformers Multivid Geometry. And it was the work of my uh, PhD student, uh, Yash, and then also uh, with uh, uh, Andrew Zisserman. Uh, and both of us supervising. So, yeah, the motivation for this is uh, the success story of uh, vision transformers. So, when these came around was when at the time when CNNs were very dominant in computer vision, and so in a sense it was a little bit surprising to see uh, a completely different architecture take over, and also even one that's just so generic. So this was up the heels of uh, transformer successes in natural language processing. And uh, one of the things that was uh, striking, and I think captured people's imaginations, maybe a bit more than the, um, the um, uh, empirical results, was that they had this emergent property that they attend to objects, even without explicit supervision. So there were a number of works from previous times where people were trying to use, for example, uh, CNNs as uh, uh, sort of semi-supervised methods for object discoveries where you you would tell them that you would supervise them with uh, whole image object classes and then you would hope that somewhere hidden in the activations there would be some sort of notion of an object. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. It was uh, whenever the a network could get away with the texture, um, for example, the giraffe would probably show up as mostly just the texture of the giraffe, and that was enough. It didn't really need to detect, uh, you know, other uh, body parts and so on. You have a sort of global uh, sense of structure. Uh, it was surprising that they showed that these architecture actually attended to objects and did these uh, almost perfect segmentations from uh, no supervision at all of these. So the motivation for this work um, is that we know that the world is inherently 3D. So we observe a 2D projection of the our 3D surroundings. And there are some very rigid laws of projective geometry that uh, are obeyed at all times. So it's just the nature of our sensors, our eyes. So this should provide us some pr useful prior information to deal with, uh, with ambiguities. But and this does not seem so uh, directly useful in light of the, you know, the, the what I talked about in the previous slide with uh, VITs uh, and Dino features, for example, be because, and the reason for that is that the observed scenes and viewpoints can have near infinite variety. So you can have so much, so much variation that it seems to kind of wash over the effect of any of these rigid laws, but they are still there and we can see them when we look at these pers perspective image you are very well aware of the the three dimensional aspects of uh, of the image um so it's kind of counterintuitive that uh, vits just excel uh, with this immense flexibility because they have no no priors like the cnns where cnns have uh, the translation equivariance property that uh, filtering affords 
So the inspiration was, okay, is these, because they're not useful at all, having these rigid laws, it seems like you should still get some mileage out of them. You just have to use them uh, in another way. So we wanted to essentially keep mm -hmm. its flexibility, but add 3D priors uh, for extra for added robustness. Okay, so one example where we can see this as being useful is uh, image retrieval of videos or photos from from a 3D environment. So uh, here are some examples um, where if you're given a query image, for example, an image of this teddy bear or image, an image of a particular fan, then we would like to re-identify it in other images. And uh, we're not talking about data sets like uh, web collected data sets where the images will be very different from each other, but more these heavily correlated uh, images typically captured from video where you are looking at the same object, but just different angles. Now, if you're in that scenario, then if you know the camera poses, then you can use uh, epipolar lines to, to narrow down the search to do this image retrieval. So let's uh, review a little bit of uh, what that is uh, in epipolar geometry. So uh, consider the red point on the left view um, labeled XL. Uh, if you think about what possible depths if you have depth ambiguity, you don't know how far away this object is. So you can see it in a pixel, but you don't know how far it is. this pixel is uh, because it was projected onto the image plane. Then you can imagine that it has a number of possible depths, uh, which are labeled here x, x1, x2, x3. So if you follow up all of these points in 3D space, if you project all of them into a second view, uh, the one here on the right, then you can see that they all form a line. And this line is what we call the epipolar line. Okay, so uh, more precisely array, but you know, uh, similar. So this is essentially the projection of the 3D line of possible depths uh, created by these uh, one pixel that we observed and we're not sure about how far away uh, it is in, in the real space. So that's the basis of uh, at least this aspect of epipolar geometry. So uh, here's a visualization of them. Uh, when you see you see a bunch of barely a bunch of points with different colors on the left, and uh, for each of these points, you can see the corresponding epipolar line on the right. So this is the line where you would search for that point in 3D, uh, because you know the camera pose, and that restricts where the point might be. So you're not supposed to search for it anywhere, it will surely be along this line. And uh, yeah, so this has implications for search, which is what we were talking about, what we started with, uh, retrieving images that are similar, uh, but just across different poses. So uh, connecting these to VIT, to VITS, uh, we know that they already search for matches uh, when they attend across images. So they uh, the attention operation is essentially uh, a small local search. So the idea is can uh, to ask, can we nudge them to do this search only along epipolar lines? And uh, here's uh, at least the first part of what we uh, propose to in order to do this. So imagine you have two images that are uh, that are given this input image pair on the left, and uh, you pass them through some CNN with shared parameters, and you get a sequence of tokens, which is what's fed to a transformer. And this is all very much like fit or or fit inspired, at least. Let's say you uh, so uh, this transformer can attend over multiple patches of the image, uh, any patches, and then it can output the class token. And this uh, uh, this is in in a form of Contrastive learning, where you are classifying whether this pair uh, is positive or negative. So, let's say uh, the input, the image pair on the on the left is actually maybe two different images. Then you would uh, still pass them through the CNN and get these tokens, pass them to the transformer, and transformer would be encouraged to output uh, 
a token that denotes that this is a negative pair, that these do not match. So it's trying, this is how you do retrieval. You would try to uh, output whether they are the same, the correct, a correct match or not. Uh, and you train these with a binary cross entropy loss. So what we added to overcomplicate it or just uh, as a way to achieve what we described, which is to get it to attend, uh, get the bit to attend to every polylines was uh, you can realize that the cross attention maps, so the attention maps between the first image and the second image, which has size S, let's say S squared times S squared, whereas S is the the size of the image, uh, you can reshape them to get a, a four-dimensional tensor of cross attention a cross attention tensor. So what does this represent? This represents when you focus on one particular patch in the first image, uh, the attention, uh, the level of attention that you get uh, on the second uh, on the a patch from the second image. So that's why it's four dimensional because you have uh, two dimensionals in the two dimensions in the first image, two dimensions in the second image. So for each possible patch across the two dimensions of the first image, you can attend over each patch uh, over the two dimensions of the second image in the pair. So uh, I hope that's clear. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can essentially take the uh, attention maps from the transformer and uh, know what's the level of attention between each pair, possible pair of, of patches across the two images. So when you reshape them like this, you can uh, interpret them in light of the epipolar uh, lines. So you know that if you interpret these attention map as a match between uh, two points, two patches, then you uh, can draw the epipolar lines superimposed into the same tensor the, with form dimensions as the um, uh, you, you extracted from the transformer. So if you direct your attention to the right-hand side of the image, you can see the epipolar lines uh, drawn superimposed on the, these two, two images. And for each of them, you see these yellow lines on a dark blue background. So these are uh, the the same lines just rasterized, so just drawn onto the tensor. And these denote this will be one. It will have a value of one when the uh, when there's an epipolar line and a value of zero when there there isn't an epipolar line. So essentially, uh, these guides will tell you, given when you center on when you're considering any possible pair of patches, does this pair uh, lie on an epipolar line or not? Um, yeah, so that, and that's the main idea. So you can use then a, a, by the same binary cross entropy loss to guide or get the attention maps to of the transformer to follow the um, uh, the epipolar lines that you you know must exist in the image. Uh, is that clear? I know it's maybe a bit of an information dense uh, slide. So if there's any questions about this part, um, uh, maybe now would be a good time. To ask them. Um, I have a small question. Mm -hmm. So basically, what the, I mean, this, just to make sure that we, I get the idea. The idea is that you are applying supervision directly on the attention weights, basically, of, of the of the, mm -hmm. of the to make sure that they attend to these lines that you have projected. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, it's okay. just the fact that they're all pairs, because you have to consider all pairs, and it's a four-dimensional tensor that makes me it may be a bit less intuitive to to see. What do you assume non-usual? Like, uh, you negative correspondence, or do you assume availability of epipolar lines? What do you assume? Yeah, that's a good question. So the the you if the if it's a negative pair, you are not imposing any epipolar uh, guides. So you just don't don't have these extra these extra losses. If it's a positive pair. Then uh, we're assuming that you know the the pose, the camera pose difference between the two images. So if you got it from uh, visual odometry or from IMU or uh, a post processing of the data set uh, as a video, then you can 
uh, you have to assume that. I have one more question, actually. The final one mm -hmm. is the image tokens 3D array, right? For example, if I use the tokens after this training, they will be 3D mm -hmm. array in addition to texture, etc. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we're trying to make sure that, so imagine, um, I guess it's maybe more uh, intuitive why it works, considering the uh, counter example. So let's say you don't have these guides and there happens to be a texture somewhere in the image that indicates a correct retrieval. Let's say it focuses on the background or, uh, well, maybe not the background, but any any kind of spurious correlation where uh, something just happens to be similar and be retrieved. The network could use that to solve the retrieval problem, but not necessarily be geometry aware. So it would solve it in a non-geometric way. It would, instead of doing these matching of patches, which we think is a useful way to go about it, uh, it would find some other solution because it's a universal approximator and who knows what's going to happen once you give it enough degrees of freedom, right? So, yeah, uh, uh, this is a way to try to steer it towards implementing the right algorithm, uh, the right algorithm according to us, which we think is uh, searching along a, a epipolar lines. Yeah, I think no one else has any questions. Okay, then uh, I can go on. Thanks. Okay, so we have this thing here, and uh, I already uh, brought this up, I guess, but if you don't have ground truth available, you can do some sort of post-processing. So, for example, with Lofter, uh, MagSec. This works well most of the time. It's enough to to give you enough supervision on most uh, on the majority of uh, of the data set in order to enforce this loss. If you if somehow fails, for example, then you just don't need to include that as part of your guidance, right? You don't absolutely need pose for every single bit of your data set. So let's consider the loss function a little bit uh, more. So let's say. This is how we implement it. Um, so walking you through it very quickly, it's symmetric. It's a binary cross entropy BC of uh, the attention map passed through the uh, the softmax, the which here is the sigma, and then uh, we have this kind of indicator function of uh, label the one where uh, it tells you whether there there is a an epipolar line or not, and you do it. Uh, from the first image to the right image or and from the right image to the first image because you have both parts of the cross attention maps. Uh, you also have self attention, which is ignored. So this is what the losses I described it so far looks like. But there's a problem, which is if you really think about it, uh, this is encouraging matches it is not encouraging you to find a match from when you consider from one patch on the first image, uh, find the best match along the epipolar line on the right image. It's actually encouraging it to have lots of matches over the whole epipolar line. And that just seems like the, the wrong thing to do. So you, you, we know that this point is probably not corresponding to an object that exists at all possible depths. It's probably only at one depth. Um, or maybe smudged a little if there's ambiguity, but uh, mostly it shouldn't be spread along the whole line. But that's what these um, that's what this loss actually gives you. So instead, what we did was we proposed these what we call the max epipolar loss, and the idea is to make it to make it match only one of the of the points across the whole. Uh, the whole line. So instead of encouraging the attention map to be high along the whole line, it should be high along one point and we don't care along that line, but we don't care that it's high along the, the rest of the line. So that's why it introduces this max operation, which is it picks out the maximum value along the epipolar line uh, and then encourages it to be uh, to, to be one inside the line and to be zero 
outside the line. And this is a bit more natural and uh, makes it so that every point on the epipolar line should have high attention. And uh, yeah, only a single point. Uh, uh, well, sorry, uh, uh, every point on the epipolar line should have high attention is what the previous loss um, was encouraging. And this max epipolar line is encouraging that on only a single point. Okay, so that's it for algorithm. Uh, we did a number of evaluations. This was on this data set, uh, the Code3D Retrieve. Uh, it has uh, five frames per video and uh, a large separation between between the, the viewpoints. So you can see that it's kind of circumnavigating the the, the an object at the center. There's a, a lot of, you know, several thousand images uh, split into training and, and testing. And importantly, the train and test set do not have the same objects. So we want to train on a set of objects and make sure that the network generalizes to other objects that weren't seen at training time. So in order to evaluate retrieval, we uh, consider each image as a query. And then other images from the same object are considered positives and all images that are not of that object are considered negatives. So that's the setup. And uh, the data set is interesting. It contains a lot of um, variation in, in how much overlap there is between viewpoints uh, across different objects. Uh, some are naturally easier than others. Uh, it also has these uh, segmentation masks, so you can omit the background if you really want to make your method not focus, not pick up on backgrounds. We have experiments with both. Um, yeah, so uh, these at the time of publishing, this was uh, pretty much state of the art. So improving things uh, quite a bit uh, on on code 3D retrieve. This was with both losses. So surpri surprisingly, the without the max epipolar loss with just the standard epipolar loss, it does still improve things. So even if it's not entirely correct, uh, encouraging the network to attend across the epipolar lines, even if you're not saying that it should be only one point rather than multiple points, it still improves things over the over just not having that at all. So that was a bit surprising, but you can get more out of it if you do. You encourage the correct thing. Sure. Uh, something. Why, why are yeah. the first with the mask background? Isn't it easier when you mask the background? Uh, with the mask background. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I think part of it has to do with the the way the attention uh, masks. Uh, the attention will also try to attend the background, and I think that. Uh, that the grades performance, at least for our method. But if you look at the even the baselines, even just these uh, RRT or uh, ResNet 50, they also have worse performance uh, with a mass background. So yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know why. I, I guess the background can still have uh, give you some clues as to uh, whether you are uh, retrieving the correct objects or not, even though we would like to make it 100% focused on the object. So I guess this is just one one more of those instances where networks don't really solve problems in the same way that we, we do. But yeah, uh, yeah, I guess we could investigate that a bit further, for sure, to, to, to know what's happening. Thank you. Um, okay, so we also tested on these Stanford on online products data set, which is uh, retrieved, I think, from Amazon or Amazon types of listings of objects for sale and uh, uh, some stock photos. And here it shows uh, an even sort of uh, a good performance. Uh, the And yeah, it's just more or less extending the results. To, to other data sets to show that even when you can see that some of the photos are really tricky because you consider it to, to be the same object even though it's uh, for example a different set of 
uh, of uh, components of the object, like the kettle with the cups or without uh, the cups, or uh, the example of these kind of oven where they, it's clearly a different oven. So, yeah. So I think it's definitely much more challenging. So, um, yeah, more qualitatively. So maybe going back to, so empirical results is one thing, improving performance is, is great, but also we want to make sure that the, what the hypothesis we have is actually correct. So we want to make sure that it does do what we wanted, which is to imbue transformers or fits with more uh, geometry awareness. So we can, what makes this nice is that you can actually visualize because they're attention maps, so they're very interpretable. So you can see what they what they look like from predictions. So here's an example. And uh, you can see what both models produce. They kind of follow the same epipolar lines, uh, even on a, uh, on a, an unseen object like this one, and uh, previously unseen or not trained on. And you can see that the epipolar lines kind of make sense. Uh, also, with the max epipolar line, it learns to do the correct thing, which is to actually have a very localized match on only one point. But then you can verify that it actually lies uh, along one of the epipolar lines uh, most of the time. So yeah, and that's how you kind of know that it has uh, gained the notion of geometry that you just don't have in a, another transformer. And uh, here's what they look like. Uh, when you have a, a negative example, so a, ne a negative pair, so these two images don't match, and you can see that the attention maps are predictably low value or more diffuse, because obviously it's normalized. Um, yeah, and here's a video of what it looks like when you rotate around an object. You can see the, epipo the predicted attention maps following the epipolar lines, and moving uh, kind of moving around in, in real time yeah um yeah so there's some qualitative examples of retrievals you can see that um well these are maybe just some examples so the numbers maybe speak a bit better but you can see that it's not easy to retrieve objects in these data sets even as a human, obviously, we wouldn't make the same mistakes as what's highlighted here for these two baselines on in red. But uh, you have to take a moment to convince yourself that it's the same object. And uh, there are some much, I think, most of the mistakes, and that's why the performance might be a bit saturated, and we might not have much more to do in terms of improving things. Is that there are some very very similar uh, looking objects in the same data set. Like you can see here that our method in the in the bottom row uh, confuses, gets confused on the fifth retrieval where it's, uh, you know, it just looks very similar. So it's kind of understandable that this happens even for the other methods. Um, yeah. So just some more examples of, of that. You can see that some of the failures are I would say, I wouldn't say impossible, but it's pretty hard. If uh, your query is the back of a backpack, then what does the front of the backpack look like, right? It could be anything. So I would say this falls in the, the category of um, difficult to improve on kinds of mistakes. Uh, yeah, so in conclusion, in this work, we aim to teach multi-view geometry to transformer networks uh, and fit. And we propose to do this with epipolar guides, which we call the light touch approach because of how um, it's not forcing the network to do it. It's just kind of encouraging it. And this only really needs the ground truth information or pose at training time, not at inference. So uh, these attention, these epipolar lines in the attention guides are produced without actual knowledge of the, the poses, which is important for, for applications. And uh, yeah, another, I guess, more or less uh, nice uh, learning from us was to, instead of changing existing architectures, was to just derive implicit loss functions that 
can be applied readily to to existing ar architectures that were already successful so not uh, trying to propose another architecture and yeah this gets state-of-the-art results in object retrieval and i think that you can maybe generalize this to other geometric relations or physical laws uh, like laws of motion and maybe the same kind of ideas apply to other uh, to, to other scenarios. Um, just before I conclude, uh, I'm not showing it here, but there's uh, we also have this paper uh, which will present in March in 3DV. And uh, it's basically a follow-up to this where we show that you can apply essentially the same the same uh, idea of epipolar guides guides to do fine tuning on new data sets. So I didn't actually show it here because um, you know we've seen I guess most most of it. But uh, when you're given a new data set for which you have no actual uh, uh, ground truth beyond the the camera poses, which you can try to retrieve to get semi automatically, this allows you to fine tune. A network that was trained on another data set. So in that one, we, for example, we took a network that was trained on a, on a, a one data set and uh, fine tuned it on, for example, a, a drone data set which has different kinds of images. So uh, it's just a way to kind of fine tune it and uh, get much better results in a scenario that the network was not trained initially on, but also does not demand. The same kinds of, the same kinds of uh, uh, ground truth that you that you would need normally for for a, a full training. Um, yeah, so that's it. So if there's any questions, um, yeah, fire away. Thanks. I know, but it might be a stupid question, John. I'm sorry. Like if you know, no, it's all right. Hands, mm -hmm. so you don't have to compute the attention elsewhere. Can you just not compute the attention only along the polar lines? Sorry, I didn't get the question. If we know where epipolar lines are, do we even need to compute attention elsewhere? Like, can is is zero in the in other places, right? Can we just compute it along the epipolar line and be done with it? Uh, yeah. So that's what uh, a previous yeah. So the the epipolar transformer. It was a previous work that proposed just that. So that that idea does make sense. Um. I guess the disadvantage is that that would be kind of like the hard touch approach. So you are kind of forcing it to attend across the people lines. So the difficulty that creates is that you then must have the pose, uh, the the actual pose between the two images in order to deploy this at test time. So if you only guide the the attention, then you can get away with only having this kind of ground truth during training. And then at test time, you don't need it. While if you enforce it, then you get, uh, yeah, you you require that at test time. So you need to, you can only deploy it in calibrated uh, uh, data sets. Uh, but it does make sense, but it does make sense. Yes. Thank you. It is probably much more efficient though, right? The search region is just a line and the attention calculation is much faster than right. Um yeah, it's more like you don't uh, mm, it's hard to compare. It's more about what what you have at what time, right? So you are running the network in uh, running the network forward anyway. The whether you calculate the epipolar lines or not explicitly that's not necess that's not a, a slow calculation in any way it's just the, the information that it needs is much stronger so you really need to have calibrated cameras and it doesn't make any sense for example for negative uh, pairs so what do you do in the case when the two images actually don't match what kind of epipolar lines do you supply to the network right to to have it attend on all, over those it's an open question. And actually, if you do that, then you are leaking information about uh, the 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 class of the of the pair, whether it's a positive pair or negative pair. So imagine the network could just learn the shortcut that 
if the epipolar lines are correct, are more or less following the object in, it's a positive. And if they are random or whatever you put in, then then it's a, a negative pair. And it then it didn't learn what you wanted. So you would have to be very careful with that. Thank you. Any other questions? Then did, did you try to use this as like a pre-training to some task other than retrieval or just retrieval? Uh, uh, that's that's a good question. I think so we didn't in this work, but we in these other 3 dv work, maybe I can just share it quickly. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and just share the paper instead. Uh, yeah, so it's still unpublished and that's why I don't really uh, maybe We don't have to record that part. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I took yeah, over. Yeah, thank, thank you for this very nice talk. I mean, it was very interesting. So, um, yeah, and thank you for accepting the invitation. Jean, come to Istanbul in person as Thanks. well. Yeah, uh, I want.